All right. Well, good day, everyone. We have right at the top of the hour, and we want to be sensitive and respectful of everyone's time as we kick off our webinar today. We want to thank everybody for joining us. We hope to have a very dynamic conversation with some of the greatest EMS minds in the country. Uh, we want to first let everybody know that we are recording the webinar. And the wonderful Amanda Reardon is uh, working behind the scenes, providing tech support. She put her contact information into the chat window. And she will also be screening and looking at, not screening, that's a terrible thing to say. She will be reviewing the questions that come in. Um, and she's going to explain to us how to send those questions in now. Amanda? Thanks, Matt. Today's session is interactive. To ask questions of our panel, please use the Q&A function represented by the double dialog box button. If you need tech support or would like to share a, a resource or insight with fellow participants, please use the chat box acceptable by the single speech bubble button for um, those issues. So tech support and peer-to-peer -peer resource sharing. Thanks so much. And Amanda, just to be clear, the, the double bubble window is supposed to look like that, not just for those of us that forgot to put our contacts in this morning, correct? It is. Um, the overlapping double bubble window is how you can connect with our panelists. So don't be shy. We will be holding questions till the end, but they will be queued up so that we can direct them to the right expert. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, we are deeply honored to have six outstanding panelists with us today. Each one of these panelists have implemented or helped provide a clinical or regulatory environment that fostered changes in EMS system delivery in their areas. Let's learn a little bit about the panelists as they introduce themselves to you. And we also want to recognize uh, the National Association of EMS Physicians and the National Association of State EMS Officials who were kind enough to voluntold uh, these folks to be on the webinar with us today. So we'll start with Dr. Vithalani and just work down the line. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks everyone for having me today. Uh, as Matt said, I'm Veer Vithalani. I'm the System Medical Director for the Metropolitan Area EMS Authority uh, and the Chief Medical Officer for MedStar Mobile Healthcare. We are uh, the EMS organization for the Fort Worth, Texas region, and I'm happy to be here. Dr. Shepke? Yep. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Ken Shepke. I'm the State EMS Medical Director for the Florida Department of Health and the Chief Medical Officer for Palm Beach County Fire Rescue in South Florida. Um, and uh, like, like Vera said, happy to be here. It's a privilege and honor. Okay, excellent. And let's move to the National Association of State EMS Officials representatives. Ashley? Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. My name is Ashley Taylor, and I am the Division Chief for EMS and Highway Safety at the Illinois Department of Public Health, and I, too, am very glad to be here and presenting today. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. And Sam, from the, from the way north, and you can give us a quick weather report as, as part of your introduction, please. Exactly. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Sam Hurley. I'm the Director of Maine EMS here in the great state of Maine. Uh, currently, it's very wide out. Um, some places in Maine are expected to get 20 inches of snow today. Uh, where I am, we're supposed to get around 12 to 13. So we will see where it goes. Uh, but I'm excited to be here and uh, excited to share the insight from Maine is how we've handled this pandemic. Awesome, thank you very much. And from the Academy of International Mobile Healthcare Integration, we have um, two excellent system leaders, um, Kevin. And, and Kevin, you do get the award for being the best dressed. Um, certainly with the hat. So Kevin, when you, would you please introduce yourself? And we, you can give us a weather report as well, but I don't think the snow travels north of the border, does it? Uh, you're right, Matt. And thanks for having me, everybody. My name is Kevin Smith, and I'm Chief Director for Niagara Emergency Medical Services. And up until about uh, five days ago, we had uh, beautiful green blades of grass showing. So that's uh, that's great for a winter up here. Um, I am, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Chief for Niagara Emergency Medical Services. We are the uh, provider for 911 services for the region of Niagara and Southern Ontario, bordering uh, New York State, uh, most infamous, of course, for Niagara Falls. Uh, and uh, happy to be here uh, representing that, but also through uh, proud participation with AMI. Thanks for having me today. All right, you're very welcome. And then last but certainly not least, Ken? Hello, my name is Ken Simpson. I'm the Interim Chief Executive Officer for MedStar Mobile Healthcare. We serve all the uh, emergency and non-emergency uh, markets in the Fort Worth Metroplex and 15 surrounding cities. So I am very happy to be here today and we have no snow in our forecast. 
And, and Ken is, is hot off of coming from a local vaccine site. So he's got firsthand knowledge of uh, some of the things that, that EMS agencies are, are doing in the community when it relates to certainly the vaccine initiative. So let's first start with um, Dr. Shepke, uh, Florida's unique community. Tell us what, what has been going on in Florida with regard to some EMS things that are interesting, unique, new things that you needed to do. Well, I'll tell you, uh, EMS, I can't be more proud of them, the way they've been involved as in the vanguard of this pandemic since the beginning. Right, right from the beginning, our governor recognized that 80% of the deaths are in the population older than 65, and we all know Florida has, has a good po population center of that. So we wanted to protect our nursing home residents, long-term care facilities, and EMS was instrumental in that, both in providing infection control guidance, visiting all of these facilities, testing both the residents and the staff members, and now actually involved in the vaccination of those. In fact, we've vaccinated all of our nursing home folks with, uh, with strike teams from, from EMS and, and from private partners. Uh, we, right in the beginning, we, we were anticipating the rollout of the vaccine. We actually did all sorts of models for EMS, whether it be mobile sites, drive-up sites, walk-up sites, and you see an example there in the picture of one of our drive-up sites. Uh, we have mobile command, uh, uh, stations and uh, the most recent project we're doing now, again, uh, along with our our push to get all of our folks over 65 prioritized for this, we are now have now trained a number of strike teams to go around the state to visit all of our Holocaust survivors in their homes to bring them the vaccine, and of course anybody else residing with them who are also in the governor's phase 1A program to vaccinate those. And when we're done with that, we'll be hitting our World War II. Uh, folks uh, and get them right in their homes. We're also reaching out to our minority communities by going out to faith-based places. Uh, we're doing mobile pods at, at uh, retirement uh, residences like 55 and older communities. Again, you have to be 65 and above, but those communities have plenty of those folks. So really EMS has shown the way for its versatility, adaptability, and mobility in, in this entire pandemic. And I think that's really, really made the push at the, at the leadership levels and the Department of Health level to see, you know, EMS really, we have to have this community paramedicine push. And I think that's gonna be the next phase in Florida is recognition mm -hmm. that, uh, that all of these outreaches have been a one aspect of the power of community paramedicine. And I think we're gonna go a lot forward, a lot more forward with that in Florida. Excellent. And, and you and Dr. Vithalani were having a conversation before the webinar started regarding um, something called delegated practice. And, and I know Dr. Veer may cover that a little bit in his, but um, have you seen as the, the state EMS medical director for the Department of Health, um, how, have, how have the medical directors been overall in uh, wanting or, or being willing to participate in some of these expanded roles for their EMS agencies? They, they've been outstanding. One of the things we did early on was really connect to everybody across the state. So we have a weekly standing Florida EMS medical director webinar, Zoom call, basically. It started off as telephone calls, but then we advanced as everybody learned the Zoom system and, and other various platforms. We now have a standing weekly meeting where we get together, we share best practices, because correct, Florida is a delegated state, so the local medical directors can uh, set their own protocols, and many of them are sharing ideas and best practices, reaching out to communities in their own areas, that are, especially the vulnerable communities in their own areas, and as we all know, EMS and fire rescue, we're, we're seen as trusted partners in healthcare among the community. We're out there right in the mix of the community members that, and residents that we serve. So it's, it's been really great to see all of EMS, all the EMS medical directors uh, to stand up and, and put out some of these best practices. Excellent. Okay, we're gonna come back to you for some more information as we go. Let's let's travel a little bit north up 95 uh, and, and across a little bit over to the west from 95. Um, Kevin, you come from a much different community than perhaps many of the communities in the states. Talk to us about what's been happening in, in the, the Niagara region and some of your roles and the things that you've done over the years to prepare for this and how you've used them during the COVID crisis. Yeah, great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, you know, thinking back to where we were in 2018 and thinking about where we are in 2021, uh, you know, nobody could have predicted what was happening. But, you know, one thing that uh, I can speak to today really is about systems approach and, and systems design and then how that has benefited us in our COVID-19 response. Um, 
and you know it's really helped make things easier if anything is easy with with any of this response to covid but um to think of uh you know again the starting point that we had with the transformation that we had made locally in a system design and, and thinking about uh how that is added to this particular pandemic response so um we had started the system transformation project of really moving and embracing mobile integrated health in this concept of uh broader integration of uh, ems paramedics within um, the greater healthcare system locally, uh, and that was at the provincial level as well as really at the local level where you find the most benefit. And so, um, you know, just to dial back a little bit pre COVID, we had done as the slide shows this mobile integrated health project, which really looked at ways in which we're responding to um, the 911 calls within our system. And um, when we think about, you know, the past uh, ways that our systems have been designed very linear and being the patient has one kind of way into the system and has to follow that trajectory throughout, uh, we created, you know, this circle of care where we provided a, a number of different ways in which we could provide more appropriate services to um, our patients and our clients. And so thinking about how that was going to lend itself to a pandemic response, we already have these developed relationships and programs that uh, are able to be leveraged and quickly adapted to um, meet the needs of this pandemic response. And so uh, we had implemented um, different programs that looked at both health and social um, impacts within our community um, that had mental health uh, and addictions response teams uh, responding to uh, 911 calls as well as ways that we could keep um, aging at home strategies in play with uh, the elderly and not needing to be hospitalized or uh, if they're waiting for long-term care you know being able to provide that support in home and so we had those pieces in play and so our initial response when we um, had the COVID-19 was of course um, internal and how are we going to make sure we protected our paramedics and we built a dashboard um, you know that was really about informing the paramedics and making sure that they had awareness as far as PPE supply and um, call volume what was happening at the hospitals what was happening with our own workforce um, and uh, I think you have a slide on that uh, uh, at some point but uh, so people can yeah there it is so um, people can actually our, our internal staff at least had an awareness of, of how we were operating as a system and that was really important to us to be able to um, share information and communicate internally and as we then were able to expand um, how we supported the COVID response obviously modifying our response plans using um, uh, card 36 and uh, developing developing pandemic response plans. We have ECNs in our dispatch center uh, and uh, using the ECN protocol to help really identify um, those callers uh, and the prioritization of how we were going to make sure they had the right care and the right place at the right time, all those great things. Um, so having that infrastructure in place really helped us move forward. And then of course we did like many people, you know, on this uh, webinar here today, I'm sure you've experienced in your areas, uh, you know, developing what we called our CCAT team, community COVID assessment response team, going out and doing swabbing for uh, people who couldn't uh, get to an assessment center. So homebound, those sorts of things, congregate settings we were going into. Uh, we developed IPAC teams where infection prevention and control were huge. And um, our experience here in uh, Ontario uh, was really about the spread, like many, through the long-term care and retirement facilities uh, that just had devastating effects. And so how could we uh, help those communities and, and IPAC was not something that we had ever thought that we'd be involved in, but being a member of our pu local public health, uh, this was a perfect fit as uh, paramedics uh, are experts in uh, PPE and, and so sharing that knowledge with uh, others in various settings was important to us. So going out and doing those things. Uh, and then also now with vaccination rollout being participants with that uh, in, in the mass vaccination plans. So really, you know, taking these sorts of things and now allowing us to expand because we know the secondary impacts of COVID have not impacted through um, infection of COVID 
themselves, we know the secondary health and social impacts that are happening within our community. So we've been able to expand those mental health supports through our mental health and, re and uh, addictions response team. We've created new programs, uh, which uh, are high intensity long term care. So these are people who are waiting to go into long term care. Um, that is not happening at this point up here for all the same reasons that I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. And uh, that either means people become hospitalized, which creates congestion within our hospital system, or we need to support them better in home. And so that's the role that paramedics are playing now in this expanded uh, way. And other things such as street outreach and the homeless population that of course has been devastated even more so through COVID. So it's really looking at how do we respond to COVID specifically, but then how are we making sure that we're involved in supporting our communities in these secondary roles. And then finally, um, you know, the takeaways really are about this integration, you know, if, if anything that we've learned prior to COVID and now going through it is making sure that your systems are integrated as part of your community health services um, is uh, it opens up a lot of opportunities for coordinated uh, delivery of those services. And then what we've learned over this last 10 months and longer now as we've been dealing with COVID is really understanding what those changes are going to be for long standing, uh, as was already mentioned, what are we going to learn that's going to change the, our approach as EMS? Let's not just go back to the way things were if and when things kind of settle down, but what have we learned and how can we take advantage of that? And I mean advantage, not in a, in a, in a personal or selfish way, but in a way that we improve our overall systems. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin. Very comprehensive. We're going to explore a little bit some of those uh, as we go through into the hour. Uh, let's move a little bit over to Maine. Sam, um, tell us about all the cool things that are happening in Maine. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, thank you for having us from the state of Maine. Um, Maine, is a, Maine takes a, a slightly different stance from NHTSA on where EMS sits in this response. We see EMS sitting as between the nexus of clinical medicine, emergency management, and public health. Uh, the difference between NHTSA's model is instead of emergency management, they put public safety. But we see us, ourselves sitting in between that nexus and how do we work within all three of those systems that sometimes are desperate or disparate and um, function separately. So Maine EMS has played an active role in the statewide response to the pandemic since January of 2020. Since that time, Maine EMS has developed al allocation algorithms for PPE supplies, guidance documents, training materials, automated notification systems, supported response to coordination uh, with coordination and uh, supported EMS, directly, EMS agencies directly. Um, as well as offer guidance to EMS educational institutions. Um, and so to just kind of dive into that a little bit deeper, because that seems a lot, very nebulous. Um, in the very early stages of this uh, pandemic, we implemented um, statewide EMD dispatch protocols that screen all 911 callers and the residents within, the, with, within that location or bystanders for COVID-19 or um, a history of COVID-19. We did have some concerns about sharing the list of all positive cases, but instead we developed a system that would screen all persons involved uh, to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. We also developed a statewide PPE algorithm. Uh, as many of you probably remember, uh, unfortunately there were, you know, extreme shortages in PPE. And so we developed an algorithm that was a risk-based algorithm. So it took into account uh, historic call volume, a, a proxy measure of risk. Um, and it took how many supplies we had on hand and then it spit out a number of how many supplies we could give to agencies. So that, makes, that made sure that we had equitable distribution of supplies. I mean, I remember seeing one EMS agency ask for a million in 95s. Um, no, you're not getting a million in 95s. You only run 7,000 calls a year. Uh, you don't need a million in 95s. Uh, but that's, that's some of those questions and requests that we were receiving early on and how do we meet the demands and needs of these agencies. In addition to that, we were tracking 
uh, the PPE supplies that they had on hand uh, so that we, we could keep tabs on that. In addition, we built a real-time COVID-19 monitoring tool in our state to monitor um, EMS clinicians and emergency medical dispatchers um, should they be affected by COVID-19. So as soon as you reported it, it took out um, that license number from the active clinicians in our state, in the state of Maine. So you reported when someone had a positive test, when someone was placed in quarantine, when they were released from quarantine, so that statewide we could actively monitor in real time um, our personnel levels throughout the state of Maine so that we knew if we needed to move resources throughout the state, we could, um, and we knew what we needed and what we didn't need. Um, in addition, we pu published a multitude of guidance documents um, to help assist EMS agencies throughout the state of Maine with decision-making when it came to COVID-19. Some of it was when to quarantine, some of it was when to wear proper PPE, when to wear full PPE, especially when we were in the beginning of this pandemic. Um, most of our agencies now have resorted to full PPE for almost all of their patient encounters. Um, but that is something that we implemented early on is pathways for them to, to have real-time decision-making. Um, in addition to that, we have developed a playbook. It's a 50-page document that literally goes step-by-step step of exactly what to do should you have someone that um, is presenting with symptoms, whether it's symptoms post-vaccination or it's symptoms that they, have a, they come to work with a cold. What do you do? How do you respond? Um, and so that has been extremely useful when interacting with these agency, with EMS agencies throughout the state. It is, has been adopted by several other states um, and all of our public safety entities in the state of Maine have actually adopted it. So it's been adopted by law enforcement departments, fire departments that don't have an EMS component. They have all adopted the playbook as we call it um, that literally has step-by-step -step guidance. One thing that I wanted to highlight that we did that um, was mentioned earlier is mental health. Um, so early on in this response, we worked with our Office of Behavioral Health within the Department of Health and Human Services to develop a 12 hour a day, seven days a week, frontline warm line that's staffed by mental health professionals, but it is designed just for public safety folks uh, and frontline healthcare workers. And so we provided that resource, we integrated it into the playbook. So if you have an outbreak at your department, which unfortunately we had, we have had a few departments. Um, I think we've had a total of seven throughout the entire pandemic that ended up with an outbreak. Uh, they actually deploy um, virtually, so via Teams or Zoom to those departments to provide support because these are scary times. It's scary to know that you may be exposed to COVID-19 and you may be taking it home to your, your, your children or your other family members. And so making sure that we provide that support um, and buffer for folks is extremely important. We've also built out testing pathways where uh, COVID-19 testing can be performed throughout the state of Maine by EMS clinicians. Um, it hasn't been very widely adopted because our, we've been conserving our EMS workforce for 911 response and for other efforts. Um, however, we do have the capacity and some of our largest testing sites are actually EMS testing sites. In addition, we have built out a robust vaccination plan where we identified two to three EMS agencies in each of our counties, which serve to vaccinate all of the public safety folks in each of those counties. To date, they've delivered almost 10,000 doses of vaccine um, and we've almost finished the entire public safety realm for the state of Maine. Uh, and so we, we are extremely excited to know that in the state we have vaccinated 3% 3, 3 of our population has finished both rounds of doses in the state of Maine, uh, in part because of the work that we have done and will continue to do as we progress through the vaccination plan developed by our Department of Health and Human Services. One thing that we, one additional thing when it comes to vaccination is dealing with vaccine hesitancy. Uh, we have seen EMS clinicians as well as other public safety professionals alike who have um, had some hesitancy. They, they didn't quite trust the vaccine. And so we have organized uh, town halls for our folks throughout the state 
where they can interact directly with regional and statewide medical directors to ask questions um, and to learn more about the vaccine. And we also developed online training. So we expanded the scope of practice in the state of Maine to allow for EMTs to provide vaccinations um, as well as AEMTs and paramedics. Uh, and so we provided online education about the vaccine, how it works, um, what, what mRNA vaccines are, um, storage advice and techniques. Um, and then for EMTs, they have a ready check vaccinate course that literally walks step by step through vaccination and a psychomotor component that they have to demonstrate in front of a paramedic or a nurse or a physician uh, to prove to prove competency that they know how to administer a vaccine before we put them um, in the field jabbing people with, with doses of vaccine. So those, those are a couple of the, the things that we have implemented in addition to broad and sweeping changes to our protocols, including the addition of shrouds for intubation and cardiac arrest. Um, and we also have diversion protocols to divert people from the hospital should they become overwhelmed. So we have a very robust response that goes from protocols all the way to the ground level agency uh, with guidance. And we've also offered guidance regarding educational facilities. The, the thing is, is at a state EMS office, we regulate everything from the EMS agencies and EMS clinicians to the educational facilities that educate them. Uh, and so it's important for us to provide guidance to all of those separate entities uh, and so I'm extremely proud of the main EMS team and the main EMS system um, for all of the incredible work that they've done. Awesome, very comprehensive. Thank you very much, Sam. Let's turn now to uh, the MedStar folks. Um, Dr. Veer, Ken, uh, what, what's MedStar been doing different over the last several months? Sure. Um, so early on when this first started, like like a lot of other folks, we sat down and we really worked through our, uh, you know, CAR 36 response, sort of the what if scenarios, uh, you know, when we started kind of trying to figure out what would happen if it got worse and worse and hospitals became overcrowded. We worked with uh, our public health partners, our, um, all of our member cities, fire departments, things like that to develop uh, contingency plans for, you know, um, alternative destinations and, and that sort of thing and how we could help support if, uh, if the healthcare system became overwhelmed, like what was being seen in, in New York. Um, you know, we, we worked with our, our local hospital partners as well. Uh, and early on, some of the challenges we had were, were just finding uh, testing that we could get back relatively quickly because obviously we didn't want um, COVID positive uh, employees coming to work and that kind of stuff. And um, so, you know, the testing was taking anywhere from 48 hours to I think the longest was about a week. Uh, and our, our hospital partners really stepped up and they were able to turn uh, tests around for us in, in about 24 hours. And, and, uh, and now we work with public health uh, to do that. Um, in exchange, we have also uh, taken a lot of our MIH folks and uh, critical care folks and we conduct uh, uh, testing clinics. Uh, for public health, uh, for people that public health sends over, there's basically a drive-through testing site that we'll have in the mornings by, by uh, invitation only, I guess. Um, and then we run those swabs to public health uh, where, they can, where they can turn the results around for that. Um, as this has, has developed and moved on, we've been fortunate enough not to have um, the hospital overloading issues uh, that we saw in New York. Uh, the, some of the wait times have increased and that kind of stuff, but um, we've really had to or really looked at different ways to, to sort of help and contribute. Uh, so we started uh, early on, we, we applied to be a uh, vaccine provider as soon as, as, soon as uh, the vaccine started becoming available here in Texas. Um, and uh, in our target areas for, for MedStar in combination with, the, with our fire partners, are sort of the underserved communities. Um, we were not targeting the large drive-through clinics like a, a lot of the places uh, necessarily, um, but working with public health, basically we use their, their registration site and, and we'll go into these underserved areas as we get vaccine um, and public health will send us, you know, a list of hundred people or so who have, uh, who have pre-registered and they'll notify them here you see a picture of us doing it one of the fire stations and those folks were notified to show up at fire station um, from like 
you know, nine to two or something like that um, to get their first dose of vaccine. And, uh, and then 28 days later, because we, we pretty much used exclusively Moderna, um, they'll have, we'll have a second vaccine site there also. Uh, one of the other big things that actually is just starting today um, is Texas Motor Sports uh, Park is hosting or is the host site for a large uh, drive-through uh, vaccination center. Uh, the objective of that site is to vaccinate at least 10,000 people a day in the first three hours. They were just under 3,500. Um, so we're, we're providing uh, some standby ambulance help and, and monitoring and things like that for that. It is a, uh, you know, that's, that, that's one of the things that has come out of this pandemic is it's become very evident uh, to us as I would imagine most of the rest of the panelists here that nobody's large enough to do this alone. Um, it requires a lot of coordination uh, that Texas Motorsports Park is, is actually in a different county, but it's in the city of Fort Worth. And so you have uh, several different municipalities helping county OEM, Fort Worth OEM, MedStar, um, you know, and everybody just, just working together to try to figure out the best way to make it work and the most efficient way to make it work and track it and that kind of stuff. Um, so, like I said, it's started at 7.30 this morning, so it's been going a whole four hours. Uh, so far, that seems to be going going pretty well as, uh, also. But um, So we've looked at... Uh, We've looked at ways to, to basically contribute to the, the vaccination um, efforts. We've uh, vaccinated our own folks as we've gotten uh, vaccines. Um, and we've, we've helped with Tarrant County Public Health's uh, vaccination sites as well by providing standby ambulances and people to, to do the vaccinations. Uh, for our workforce through this, it's, it's obviously a stressful time. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, getting uh, PPE was difficult early on. Um, we went ahead and went the P100 route uh, since N95s were so difficult to get. Um, the P100s weren't necessarily early, but we ordered them early or easy, but we ordered them early enough that we were able to get some uh, get some of those in. Um, and so we've also hosted a lot of town halls, had a lot of conversations with you know with our frontline folks, um, tried just doing welfare checks and and spending time out in the field um, with them from the, you know, from myself to the supervisors, Matt, you've been out some, um, just kind of checking in and making sure every, everybody's doing okay with it. Uh, we adopted a lot of policies and procedures early on as far as how we deal with people that were positive um, before the federal government came out with the, with the uh, FMLA requirements. We had, um, you know, let our folks know that we would provide them up to two weeks of, uh, of paid time off outside of any other time that we gave them because we wanted, we didn't want people to worry about, you know, going unpaid or having to burn their own time. Um, we wanted them just to focus on, you know, getting better and, and that kind of stuff. stuff. Uh, of course, we, you know, mandated the PPE and that kind of stuff to try to make sure uh, that everybody was taking the appropriate uh, measures to protect themselves. And so, um, you know, those were kind of, those have been kind of our, our largest activities as of late. I think Dr. Rear is going to talk a little bit about monoclonal body uh, infusions and some of the protocol changes that, that uh, have been made. Yeah, thanks, Ken. And uh, definitely yeah. a great summary of, of our vaccine rollout uh, so far. Um, so one of the things we did very early in the pandemic too was implement a, a, what we call a COVID non-transport referral program. I know a number of agencies have this and, and it's essentially um, a, uh, you know, a paramedic initiated refusal, which is traditionally considered something that's fairly taboo um, in our agency. But for this specific subgroup of patients, which are um, patients where there's a, a high suspicion of COVID-19 illness, um, there's no high risk, um, you know, history, exam findings, no high risk medical history, um, and no, no really uh, a provider suspicion of high risk illness. Um, we are uh, leaving these folks at home, providing them with home care instructions um, information on how to get tested and, and who to follow up with. Um, and, and compared to a lot of agencies that have been uh, sort of holding on to these programs and waiting for things to get really bad at the hospital, um, we took the approach that um, starting slow and getting our, our providers used to it um, would be a, sort of a better way of handling it. So we actually went live in March. Um, we've had a number of these happen. We, we in general have a couple a day. And it's interesting because as the case counts go up in the region, you can also see the number of COVID non-transports uh, follow the same, much like the hospitalization rates. And so 
Um, that worked out pretty well for us. It, it has provided a little bit of relief for the hospitals, um, less so when they don't need it and more so when they do. Um, and so it, it wasn't something that we had to turn on and off. We've just had it ongoing since the public health emergency was declared. Um, the other big program that we've been working on, as Ken mentioned, was the monoclonal antibody therapy. So um, as most of you are aware, back in November, uh, there were two uh, drugs that uh, got their emergency use authorization from the FDA uh, for the use in a mild to moderate COVID-19 infection with a, with a primary goal of keeping people out of the hospital. And I think there's some relatively mixed or, or controversial evidence about them, um, much like a lot of things have when, when applying for their EUA. Um, but the state of Texas picked it up pretty well and, and started initially by disseminating it out to all the hospital systems with the understanding that they would give it to their outpatient communities. Um, and so in Fort Worth, we have four big hospital systems here, and most of them ended up using their emergency departments, um, not for any other uh, reason other than they have isolation beds and, and PPE and uh, ways to handle these sort of patients. And so <clears throat> the, the problem was is it's not the best use of the resource of the emergency department, and it's also not necessarily um, the best um, avenue for access for patients that don't have access to, to primary care or something else. Um, there was conversation that started uh, locally about whether we needed to stand up what we call a regional infusion center where everyone would pool their resources with both the monoclonal antibody infusions, but also staff, um, patients, et cetera. And the hospitals didn't really uh, bite for this. They had less drug than they had patients. And so for the most part, <clears throat> they were um, uh, happy to, to do it on their own. Um, but over the, the past 10 months or, or so, we've had a number of uh, EMS and fire providers uh, get ill. A number of them have been hospitalized um, and a couple unfortunately uh, died as well. And so we, we wanted to, to do something uh, as much as possible to, to try and prevent these hospitalizations. And we've already been um, doing some home care uh, packs. You know, we give um, home pulse oximeters, uh, you know, over-the-counter medications on, on rare occasions, some oxygen and things like that. Um, but, but this seemed to us to be an avenue where we could potentially take high-risk uh, EMS uh, providers, high-risk family members of EMS providers, as, and, and try and keep them out of the hospital, especially with the, the high spike in hospitalizations that we've been having recently. Um, so we decided to roll out a program. Uh, Matt mentioned earlier that we're a delegated practice state, and as, as um, is in the same as Florida, any local medical director can, can train and credential their EMS providers to do uh, really anything that's within uh, the medical director's scope of practice. <clears throat> um, so we developed a monoclonal antibody infusion program. Um, it follows the same EUA criteria that both of those have. So essentially um, high risk for, for a severe illness from COVID-19. So over age 65, some uh, short list of uh, pre-existing medical conditions um, for adults and then 12 to 17 year olds with um, you know, bad chronic illness or um, severe obesity. Um, and we essentially started off by picking a room in our um, fire department headquarters that was able to be washed down and put a couple gurneys in it and just started. Um, we developed uh, our program based on the playbooks that are out there from um, the operation and Eli Lilly Corporation, um, which had put out some good, uh, good documents, thankfully, that we could um, uh, expound upon. But most of those were designed with the concept of a, of a physician nurse model as opposed to an EMS centric model, which is what we were using. Um, and much like a, a lot of our programs that we have, we essentially um, replaced a lot of the staff with purely uh, EMS and fire paramedics. Um, and it's been working uh, pretty well for us so far. Uh, we've opened this up to uh, first responders and you know, first responder adjacent individuals, so family members, et cetera. Um, they call a single a number when they've identified that they have um, a family member or they themselves are uh, sick and have um, met the eligibility criteria. They call a phone number that's answered by one of our uh, communication supervisors in our communication center. Uh, they double check all the criteria um, and then uh, schedule them using an online booking software that we have. Um, and then we uh, set up a team and go out and, and do the vaccination, or I'm sorry, the, the infusion as well as the post-infusion monitoring. Um, that all gets documented in our EPCR. Uh, we set up a, a separate run sheet specifically for monoclonal antibody infusions. Um, we report it to the state uh, per all of their requirements. Um, and, and we've been talking about whether we need to expand this out to the public, um, mm -hmm. especially if, uh, if demand starts to outstrip supply for the hospitals. Um, we've uh, been in negotiations and, and uh, discussions with a number of um, primary care groups that don't have access to, to hospital privileges. Um, we've uh, developed a model where we could use our MBUS um, to, to use that as an infusion center where we could park it either at our headquarters or on hospital grounds or something like that and, and pre, um, pre set up infusions. Um, so a little bit more to come still, but it's so far it's been fairly successful. We've done 
Um, a number of these so far, pretty much all of them have stayed out of the hospital, uh, which, uh, you know, unfortunately is a relatively small end, but um, it's uh, at least a little bit of impact that we can hope to make. So. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Veer. And uh, Ken, you mentioned Texas Motor Speedway uh, attempting to do uh, 10,000 vaccines in one day through a drive-through. Does that mean that the, the participants that are coming for vaccine have to get up on the embankment at 190 miles an hour and, um, and, and get vaccinated that way so we can get them in and out quickly? Is that? Yeah, it's a lot harder for the, for the um, vaccine shooters to run them down. <laughs> yeah. And just wants me to drive the chase car that goes next to people. That's right. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thank you guys very much. Ashley, thank you for being so patient. Uh, Illinois, big communities in Illinois, very diverse systems. Uh, what have you guys been doing at the state level in Illinois? Yeah, thank you very much. So um, just a little bit about Illinois um, and how our EMS um, system functions. So um, through the division of EMS at the Illinois Department of Public Health, we do have 62 EMS systems that are ran by um, local EMS medical directors. And we have over 600 EMS provider agencies throughout the state. <clears throat> we also coordinate our education and licensing um, as well as the EMS um, for Children's program and trauma and stroke programs as well. So we have a lot going on in our state um, from as far as our division is concerned, but you know, primarily as COVID happened, um, starting in February, we um, looked at what, how is that going to affect our personnel, you know, looking at um, what do we need to do first and prioritizing, you know, looking at keeping our personnel working as much as we could. So we did um, sort of right off the bat in March, we extended licensures um, for three months initially to keep everybody working. And then that was the last thing that they would have to worry about was trying to get their renewal in and all their CEs sent in to get their renewals done while they were still trying to take care of all these patients as we saw our first wave come on in April. Um, some other things that we saw happening um, at the local level was um, we had put out some guidance as far as transport algorithms as we started to stand up alternate care sites and facilities, one of those being um, McCormick Place in Chicago, looking at what those transport algorithms would look like so that then the local providers could get their plans in place as far as how they would get those patients there if we were to use a facility, how those algorithms would work about the appropriateness of those patients that would go to the facilities and um, as well as the treat and not transport protocols. So looking at with medical control, um, how to properly assess those patients and determine whether they needed to use an emergency room or not. Um, alternate staffing patterns. So in Illinois, we have uh, very diverse systems. Um, we have metropolitan areas. We are very rural areas. So um, understanding that if, you know, we came upon a situation where we had multiple people quarantined, um, that we encouraged our providers at the local level to have plans in place that if they needed to go to different kind of staffing models. So some of our systems have paramedic, paramedic teams, um, moving those to an EMT paramedic team um, if necessary, um, but having those plans um, pre-drawn up. So in case that those waivers needed to come in or a change to a system um, plan through a modification needed to occur, they could do that. Um, other examples that um, they took on were pronouncements in the field um, for those systems who didn't already have that in place. Um, we started to see and have continued to see throughout the response more integration of our mobile integrated health programs. Um, one system, for example, put in place a really great model where they had their triage nurses um, taking calls, evaluating those patients over the phone, developing or determining what level of care, whether it was a BLS or an ALS call, sending kind of like the sprint team out to their location and then determining based on patient assessment um, if there was a need for an emergency department visit or could they be redirected to an urgent care that was working closely with that program or if it was a behavioral health um, situation if they could go to the local behavioral health center um, to take a load off the emergency departments. So those have been successful. We're continuing to monitor those programs and evaluate for more um, that are coming online. So we're thankful for those. Um, type of programs in our communities. Um, another kind of adaptation we had to take on was our emergency medical services for children site surveys. Those were usually we would go out to the hospitals and evaluate um, those hospitals and their programs they have for um, the care of pediatric patients um, at the critical care level or standby um, emergency departments and doing those virtually instead. So that has um, 
our team for the EMSC program took that on and have done a great job and our hospitals have come to adapt to that process. So um, I don't know that we'll continue it, but it was something in the interim that we took on and decided that it was still important to continue. So we did them virtually. Another um, situation was as our staff were redirected to work remotely, um, having the ambulance providers do their self-inspections. So that has been going on, but we're working on a process to get the ambulance inspectors back out um, on site at the provider level to do those inspections once again, now that we've been a year into this um, pandemic. Access to PPE for EMS providers was also a challenge for us. We, didn't, we had requests for resource processes for our hospitals and local health departments through our ESF-8 plan. But one of the challenges was figuring out where EMS was gonna go to get their PPE whenever they needed to be replenished, um, whether that be their resource hospital or through their local EMAs. So we put processes in place for that. Um, I would say it was a challenge at first and many revisions later, we finally got it worked out to where it's, um, if there's a need for PPE and EMS providers were unable to get it that they now can go through the, their local EMAs to get that, um, those supplies. We started right off the bat also doing enhanced communications. So I started back at the Department of Public Health. I was previously the hospital preparedness coordinator for hospitals, but came back as the EMS division chief in January. And then we quickly, once the pandemic started to ramp up, started weekly webinars with our EMS providers and our um, resource hospitals and EMS systems. So communicating with them often was very important for us. Um, getting guidance out in a timely manner so that if plans needed to be developed or changed that they were um, had the latest guidance to be able to do that. Um, as we saw EMS providers becoming affected and the ongoing pandemic happening, we uh, became concerned with, you know, first responder mental health. Um, we were able to partner with the National Alliance on Mental Illness and did a behavioral health webinar where we had one of our paramedics from Chicago Fire come on and talk about um, dealing with COVID, the ongoing response. And then at the same time, we also had civil unrest going on. So um, that was a, a big impact for a lot of our providers. You know, they were scared just not only because of the pandemic and not wanting to affect their families or themselves, but then um, the risk for injury if they were put in a situation where they were in, in the middle of civil unrest. So um, dealing with all of that. Um, we also looked at um, licensure changes. So we came um, to a point where we, uh, some of our classes were ending for EMT and paramedic courses and they were unable to test because there wasn't a site available for them to go and take their national registry. At the same time, during the middle of the pandemic, we switched from continental testing as our testing mechanism for our, our personnel to get licensed to national registry as the mechanism for that. So. Um, we put in provisional certifications at the system level that allowed for the EMS systems who manage those education programs and monitored them to um, determine the competency level to ensure that the personnel were able to practice and do in the meantime until the person could test and get their national registry that they were able to do a provisional certification and then enhance the workforce as well. So um, that was important, um, getting the messaging out for that, uh, uh, all the EMS systems understanding the process and how that would work. And then as we've started to see more sites open up for those um, personnel to go and get their licensures, they've, they've been able to take the cognitive portion of the national registry in order to get their Illinois licensure. Um, we expanded the scope of practice. Our paramedics currently have the ability through their scope of practice in Illinois to do uh, vaccinations through an approved vaccination program, but we expanded through the state declaration to allow for our AEMTs and EMTIs to perform COVID vaccin vaccinations if it's approved by the EMS medical director in that system. So they're able to go and assist at their hospitals that are nearby or also through local health department vaccination clinics. So that is enhance the workforce for the volunteer workforce for the local health departments as well, who we know, and in very rural environments here in Illinois, they just don't have a lot of staff to help. So that has helped to get the vaccinations um, done. We also have one of our Mavis divisions working on a pilot program to become their own vaccine provider to start um, vaccines at one of the local schools up north. So 
that is going to be coming online, I think, in the next couple of weeks. We also had to consider that um, waivers for TNS or trauma center coverage. Um, we, for example, had an entire surgical team out based on an exposure um, for a surgeon. So having to modify some of that coverage um, and provide waivers for a certain period of time for that as they got uh, some staff to come in to cover um, that trauma center's coverage. Staffing waivers due to personnel exposure, of course, those are always some things we had to consider. Barriers. So as you know, locally driven EMS systems with different medical directors, different points of view, um, they all kind of function alike, but differently at the same time. So um, trying to, of course, keep on, uh, keep on top of all of that with our regional EMS coordinators at the state level as well. Um, not, we also brought on the ability um, and guidance for our, of course, to do the vaccinations, but also the Binax Now testing at the local level as well. So putting out guidance for that, not all the EMS systems wanted to take that on. So there was variability through the state. Of course, as I mentioned before, we had barriers with um, the access for EMS to get PPE at the beginning, now that it's um, gotten better and improved throughout. Um, hospital throughput issues were being experienced in our EDs causing increased offload times for EMS and increased requests for bypass. So um, not only working with EMS, but we work very closely with our EDs and our emergency departments um, and the hospitals and their administration to talk about um, those throughput issues that may come up and how we can help to um, facilitate maybe some improvement with that so that we don't have EMS waiting 45 minutes to offload um, patients so they can get back out on the streets. And then we also saw some EMS personnel um, continue to do see EMS personnel, personnel not wanting to get vaccinated. So we're highly encouraging that to happen. Um, our resource hospitals have been uh, paramount in encouraging that to happen um, and making it accessible for them um, and our local health departments too. So kind of bringing that partnership together with the local health departments and bringing on our um, EMS personnel to help with that, I think has provided education and good experience for them to see the benefits of um, the vaccine being out there for our communities and really building that partnership that may not have been as solid as it could have been in previous years while we talk about preparedness and response and all of that. I think this pandemic has really brought to light some things that, some opportunities that we have and relationships that we need to continue to build. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. Obviously a lot going on in Illinois. I want to um, go back to some of the collaborative discussions. So we have, you know, Sam, Ashley as, as state EMS directors. We've got uh, Dr. Shepke, who has a unique role, both as the chief medical officer of an agency, but also the Department of Health's EMS director. Could you guys share with us, maybe the three of you, um, some of the what you think are the best examples where agencies have collaborated with state regulatory authorities, uh, both regulatory and clinical authorities, uh, and, and really have implemented some programs during the pandemic that would not have been possible without good collaboration? Sure, I, I can say one, one of the things that we had at the state level, um, we had problems we, obviously, we all know that the paramedic schools are the pipeline to, to for our workforce. And when the pandemic first hit and we had PPE shortages, students were no longer allowed to ride and they lost their clinicals and they are required to have a certain number of in-person clinicals. So we got that feedback from the local agencies, from our, from our statewide uh, interest groups like our Florida Fire Chiefs Association and ambulance associations. And that came up to us at the state level, and we created an emergency order that the Surgeon General signed off on, allowing 100% high fidelity training during this pandemic. Along those same lines, we had uh, just, you, you heard in this presentation, issues with folks being able to take the various continuing education credits that they needed. So we, we again, created an emergency order, allowing those, uh, uh, delaying the, the uh, relicensures for uh, until June 2021, I believe it is. So I think the emergency order has been one of the key ways that we've been able to get around some of the regulatory hurdles and the partnership between the, the local level and filtering that, the, those concerns up to their various constituent agencies up to the state level has really helped that partnership. 
Sam, Ashley, how about you guys um, from, from the state regulatory side to interfacing with those agencies that are on the front lines every day? Yeah, so in Maine, we have, bi it was weekly. Uh, now we have bi-weekly meetings with EMS agencies throughout the state of Maine um, where they can ask any question they want to ask. Um, and we actually, as part of our playbook, um, we interact directly with the agency should they have an outbreak to guide them step by step through that process. So um, our system is, it wraps around the agencies per se um, to make sure that we can provide all of the support and assets of the state government um, to help support these agencies uh, should they have an outbreak. Um, I will say that not to toot our horns, but uh, our office, we do have an epidemiologist in our office. Um, and so that makes it th things very easy uh, we don't have to call the CDC, the main CDC to get um, epidemiology support. We have it within our office. So the, that person can get on these phone calls, can support the agency, can guide them through step by step what to do next, um, who to quarantine, how to quarantine. Um, and so that's been very convenient to help support our, our each of our EMS agencies should they have positive cases of COVID-19 and having that pathway for people to interact with us because we too changed education standards, we extended licensure, um, we uh, commuted some uh, CEH requirements. Um, instead of having in like hands-on skills, we commuted it to just um, online learning so that way people aren't forced to do hands-on skill stations. Um, we, we made a lot of changes based on the input and feedback that we got from the EMS agencies that we work with on a daily basis. Um, and I think that's the most important part um, of our response is having that collaborative approach where the, we get the feedback from the agencies and that we as the state come up with a solution to help manage their issue. Uh, that's, the, that's the approach that we've taken here in Maine and trying to preempt some of those issues um, but when they pop up, coming up with a collaborative solution to address them. Thanks, Sam. Ashley, anything you want to add? Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, one of the examples that we would have here in Illinois is that we saw some hesitation with the use of um, the rapid testing for our EMS agencies and our providers. And, you know, we really took a collaborative approach to that and getting our lab representatives from IDPH on the phone to answer questions with them to relieve some of that anxiety and have since seen more come online to um, use those systems um, and have those in place to, you know, identify those who may be symptomatic early on and um, get them quarantined and isolated as soon as possible. So um, also working with our communicable disease section quite closely whenever it came to um, our local health departments needing to partner with our agencies to determine whether somebody needed to be isolated and the appropriate time frame for that um, was also a useful partnership for us as well. Excellent. Thanks. Let's turn to um, uh, Dr. Vithalani, Shepke, um, and others. So how do um, medical directors, you know, every physician, every medical director may have a little different perspective on what their agency should be doing. When you're working with your agency, what are some of the tips to having that good collaborative relationship, brainstorming ideas, implementing new, new ideas? Um, how do you like to be approached when it comes to those types of things? So, you know, from my perspective, I think there's a couple of things that come to mind when I, when I think about um, new programs or new things that we've been talking about, especially during the pandemic. Um, one is it's a pandemic. Um, everything is new and you're not going to feel comfortable with anything. So just put that aside for a little bit. Um, you know, I, I had never even dreamed of prescribing monoclonal antibodies to anyone for the, my entire career, um, let alone being involved in any sort of vaccination effort. I mean, I went into emergency medicine. Okay. It's not normally what we do. Um, but having said that, you know, I, I think uh, as uh, a gentleman from Maine mentioned, you know, EMS exists in these crossroads of all aspects of the healthcare continuum. Um, and, and so we have this gap that we can fill quite well, and especially coming from delegated practice states like Dr. Shepke and myself, um, it's very easy for systems like ours to be nimble because as all it takes is for me to sign a piece of paper and boom, we're good. You know, assuming you've got all the training and, and uh, expertise uh, of your professionals uh, with you, um, it, it makes it really straightforward. And so 
like with a lot of things that we do, I think that the easiest question is to just ask yourself, is this the right thing to do for your patients, right? Um, and, and there's a reason, you know, I live in my service area is to say, is this what I would want for me and my family? And, and um, you know, if, if I had a family member that tested positive and met, you know, let's say infusion criteria, would I send them? Well, yes, I would. And so that's, that's the, the easy test that I always have, have kept, whether it's during the pandemic or otherwise. Dr. So I, I say that at, at its heart, uh, EMS and fire rescue, we are problem solvers and we live in chaos. And so chaos is just another day for us. And I think emergency medicine and EMS are unique in that, that we expect something new is going to happen every single day. So we kind of have that mindset to begin with. And we already at any, any given time have plenty of new protocols going on that we're trialing out either at a, at a battalion level or even system wide or across systems. We share a lot of ideas across the state of Florida amongst, because there, there's, again, like Veer mentioned, we are, we are a delegated practice state. So we have a number of individuals that are really innovative that are on our team that are constantly trying new things out. And then we share those experiences. So whether it's ketamine for status epilepticus, head of CPR, or in this case, now we're dealing with how to get testing, vaccinations out to the masses, out to the folks that are homebound. I think we're just well situated for that. And I do think that the delegated practice allows us to be really nimble, as, as Dr. Vithalani just, just mentioned, and allows us to change things very quickly, which is really helpful. I think Let's one talk. Of the thing, sorry, Matt. Go ahead, I'm one sorry. Thing I think is, is so important, and, and I think um, those of us on the panel uh, have, have, are able to live this every day, is that um, you know, I, I'm blessed by having a full-time position. I know not a lot of, not a lot of other people uh, have that, but it, it makes things really easy when everyone has the same goals in mind. Um, and it makes things really uh, straightforward and easy to, to implement when, when you know, um, the, the medical team and the operations team are, are aligned in what they're trying to accomplish and have that close working relationship that, that exists through you know, organizations like ours. So. Great reminder, the rules to live by, right? Uh, a little bit more quickly, um, so Sam and Ashley, state laws are sometimes difficult to change. What are some examples uh, from your states or from other members of the National Association of State EMS officials that they can be more nimble without having to change statutes? What, what are the waiver possibilities, demonstration projects, pilot projects? How much flexibility is there and how can the state EMS director help with that sort of innovation? Yeah, so for the state of Maine, uh, we have the Maine EMS board, which has a lot of flexibility um, to change any of the rules, and they have the authority to waive any and all the rules um, as needed. Uh, so our board can do any of that. They meet monthly. Um, we did have an, one emergency meeting um, in the very beginning that delegated authority for me and the chair of the board to actually waive rules um, independently of the board. So I, as long as I have consensus from the chair of the board, uh, the chair and I can waive rules in the state of Maine for all of EMS, which is very convenient um, as we go through this process. Uh, additionally, we have our medical direction and practices board, which define our statewide protocols that are in use in the state of Maine, and they are meeting every two weeks, sometimes every other week, I mean every, every week, um, to make sure that we keep our protocols nimble as well. Um, Maine is a delegated practice state. However, uh, the way our protocols are designed is the practice is delegated from the state medical director um, and from the state EMS office. And so we have the ability and the capacity to change scope of practice and to change our protocols um, with the drop of a hat. Uh, we try to avoid that because there's education resources required to do so. Um, but we have uh, one thing that I can say that we have used um, specifically during this pandemic is extensive use of online education and training uh, because we can record who viewed the training, did they complete it, how did they score. Um, and so we have extensively used our statewide learning management system to implement training. So to use our pandemic protocols that we implemented, there was an associated statewide training that they needed to complete. Every EMS agency in the state of Maine received Buy Next Now test. To use the Buy Next Now test, you had to complete um, 
you had to complete the, the online training to do swabbing. You had to complete the training to do vaccinations. You had to complete the training and then resources like the playbook to help make sure that we consolidate uh, the information and communicate it effectively. Uh, as many of you probably know, going to the US CDC website and looking for something is like looking for a needle in the haystack. Uh, and so that's, that's the beauty of having it all consolidated into one place with a step-by-step -step guide of what to do next. And so that has been extremely helpful for our state. Um, and I can tell you, I refer to it. I refer people to it in specific pages on a daily basis. I can tell you exactly what page you need to go to to find that information uh, when people call. So it has been extremely beneficial for us um, in communicating those changes um, and making sure that we can share them uh, efficiently and effectively. Ashley, very quickly, how about in Illinois? Um, Illinois also has some flexibility with a waiver clause in our rules. So we're able to um, do that, of course, with um, some consultation with our EMS, our state EMS medical director, Dr. Keg, we do that. Um, and also there was a lot of access for our EMS medical directors to um, look at other state best practices to be able to implement things. Um, and then we also at the state level even reached out to other states like Michigan whenever we were um, looking at developing a mock um, platform potentially. So um, looking at what's out there and trying to implement something similar. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin Smith, we're gonna come back to you for a second. So you've listened for an hour, but you've also been involved in a number of associations that like AIM High that are international and you, you probably look at the, the American healthcare system from the Canadian perspective and sometimes scratch your head. Uh, how is all of this different in Canada uh, in the regulatory environment and the clinical environment that you're in as compared to the U.S.? Well, first of all, um, before identifying what might be different, it's, it's understanding what is actually the same independent of what health systems you're in. And that is the approach that we take is it's all hands on deck and, and everybody working together to do what needs to get done. And that's to provide the services we do and take care of our communities, uh, job number one. And, you know, from there, it, it's how do we do that then? And, and as has been mentioned, you know, um, coordinating regulations and, and approaches uh, is certainly a complex thing to do. And that's no different here in Canada. Uh, even, you know, going across province to province, as, uh, there's different ways in which healthcare is delivered. And so standardizing approaches certainly is not uh, something uh, that happens here in Canada. It's going to vary province to province. And then within the provinces themselves, depending on how they're set up, I see we have some colleagues from uh, BC uh, with us here today. And, and that's more of a provincial approach to how they might do things where in Ontario, it's a little bit more fragmented in the sense where um, it's a provincial health system, but it's uh, broken down into different uh, geographic areas. And then EMS delivery is, uh, is not part uh, specifically of the large healthcare system. It's, it's delivered at the municipal, so at the city level. And uh, that creates all kinds of challenges. And so going back to some of the comments that I had made, you know, talking about our success was really about overcoming those barriers and challengers by making sure that um, the relationships uh, exist with the, the agencies that uh, you're going to need some flexibility in, in, in partnering with to be able to do some of these unique things as problem solvers, as people who deal with crisis on a regular basis to say, why can't we do things different? And, and we don't have time to overcome a lot of the uh, uh, bureaucratic and administrative processes that might normally take place. And so it's really important to have those relationships to go forward. And so that's what we found. And uh, again, the, the strength in having done that before the pandemic uh, has been uh, important to us to be able to uh, move and have that agility. But even in absence of that, uh, you know, understanding about uh, what those barriers are, how to overcome them, that they're, they're really no different than uh, what's been discussed here. Um, as far as scope of care, certainly that comes uh, through other delegation authorities that we've worked with both locally and provincially to expand the scope of practice for paramedics here uh, to, uh, to do those other clinical interventions that uh, many have talked about. And so that work continues very similar to what uh, is happening and been described elsewhere. Okay, excellent. And we're going to do a quick lightning round. So in, in one minute from each of our panelists, then we're going to do some a uh, couple of questions from the questions that have been sent in. 
So what do you think is next on the horizon for EMS um, through the end of the pandemic and, and beyond? Ashley, let's start with you. I think for me, I, I would consider us further exploring the use of community paramedicine and mobile integrated health and how we can um, engage EMS even further into um, what we can do outside of the hospital walls would be that for me. Okay, Kevin, how about you, sir? Yeah, absolutely. With with Ashley, you know, I don't know how many times I'm going to talk about mobile integrated health here, but it's the lessons learned that we don't go back to normal, that we understand the benefits that, uh, you know, our profession can provide in the broader scope of uh, delivery of health and social services in some cases, and taking those learnings and making sure that they're not lost, that they become entrenched within our future system designs. Excellent. Ken Simpson, how about you, sir, from your perspective? Um, you know, I would agree, obviously, we'll kind of help finish with the uh, vaccination plans, but, um, you know, more with the, the triage and the mobile health care, I think that's a, a perfect fit for EMS. It's like everybody's kind of said, um, we sort of fit in that gap and, and we can help, uh, you know, figure out the best resources for people to go to. So. Excellent. And Sam, before you go out and shovel. What are your thoughts exactly. on that? Exactly. I would just agree with everyone else. It, it is community paramedicine and how does that meet the needs of the community and how does that integrate within the health system um, when you're looking about interfacility transports and those types of things? How do we bring, how do we integrate closer with these health systems um, that we're not the redheaded stepchild of healthcare anymore, that we are a critical part to the healthcare system? Um, and it doesn't work without EMS, despite what they may think. Wow, that's the quote of the day. It, it, it doesn't work without EMS. We'll let people define what it is. That was good. Thanks, Sam. Dr. Shepke, how about you? I think there's an enormous recognition of EMS uh, as, a, as a new, as really, a really adaptable branch of healthcare. And the ability to bring the ER to the patient or bring the hospital to the patient with these ideas of mobile integrated healthcare, community paramedicine, whether it's from testing or vaccination or anything for that matter, I think there's been a real recognition and the lights turned on. I know all of us in this field have recognized that possibility, but I think the folks in power and leadership have all recognized that. And I think for the state of Florida, we're now making a formal push to have its own separate bureau and an organized plan. We've been dabbling in that for a while, but I think it's, you're, we're really going to see community paramedicine flourish as, as an industry after this. And I'll say one more thing, and I think that's not going away. I know folks don't really want to hear this. I don't think masks are going away. I think this is like how we went from no gloves to gloves when HIV came around. I think now we're going to go from wearing no masks in the back of the rescue to wearing masks on anybody with any sort of infectious disease or respiratory type complaint. That doesn't mean we're going to be doing around the around the station anymore once we get this under control. But I do think that this is going to change the way we routinely look at PPE. One of the things we did see is that we don't have any influenza this year, right? And that's because of all the various COVID stuff that we're wearing, all those mitigation measures. And I think that that's one best practice that we've learned is how to protect ourselves from respiratory illness. Yep. Great point. And Dr. Vissalani, bring us home. Yeah, so uh, uh, Dr. Shepke just uh, grabbed grabbed what I was going for is essentially, I think we have to figure out where, where we're going to settle. We're not, you know, the, the, the old days are behind us. We are never going to get back to where things were. I think we need to figure out um, what things are going to look like in the future, not just from a, a response model perspective, but also from a, from a clinical perspective, looking at all the different things that we've, we've impl implemented over, over this past year, especially things like PPE and, um, and some of the, the care changes that we've made. Um, I think uh, we can hopefully take some growth away from this negative time. Excellent. Amanda, let's bring you in. Uh, we can probably take um, one or two questions that have come in that you think, um, or maybe general themes that these experts can weigh in on. Um, the First of all, kudos to the panelists. They've been doing an amazing job answering um, some of these questions in writing throughout the session. Um, we have received three or four questions about provider mental health, well-being, resilience, um, and topics along those lines. How are you taking care of the people that take care of others? 
Yeah, so Ken, I know that um, you've done a lot here. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, you know, we have, we're fortunate we have a, a say organization or, or group called the Hope Squad, which is, which is really just peer support. Um, you know, they do a really good job uh, helping us to, to kind of uh, keep an eye on our workforce. Um, additionally, we've, we've, like I said, continued with ongoing messaging with, uh, uh, and communication with, the, with our frontline providers, provided opportunity for uh, questions and answers, feedback, um, just really, you know, gotten out there with them to, to sort of see what's going on and see how they're doing and see how they're holding up and things like that. If, you know, if uh, we have concerns that people need a little bit of a break, you know, we, we do what we can to try to, to try to give them a break and give them some time, you know, some little things like just providing food and, and that kind of stuff uh, for no real big reason at all, other than, you know, uh, going through what, everybody's going through right now with the pandemic um, and really just listening and, and trying to be as supportive as we possibly can. We, um, knock on wood, we've had pretty good luck with it overall. Um, you know, people have been really receptive and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback with regard to, you know, people really just appreciating the fact that, you know, we're there to listen and, and lend an ear and try to do what we can and, and uh, give folks a little bit of time if they need time. So. Excellent. Amanda, another question? Um, um, we've received several questions about how to encourage the increase of a number of EMS professionals that elect to take the COVID-19 vaccine. I know some people have tested, touched on this as well, but um, quite a bit of interest in that topic. So Dr. Shepke, you've done a lot of national education on this. Do you want to take a first crack at that? Yeah, we're happy to. Um, I think uh, based on the conversations with the folks that uh, have been nervous about getting this and the ones that have been gone on taking that, education is the key. Or the, is the key. Um, I, I don't think that we should, as EMS medical directors, be salesmen for this, but I think it's our responsibility that for folks to make an informed decision with the actual facts, not with the various misinformation and rumors that you might find on the Internet and social media, et cetera, that are often incorrect, scientifically inaccurate stuff. So I think once once you get the training out there, speak about how it, we were we simply are scientifically able to make a vaccine so quickly, why it's why it's deemed to be safe for various populations. Once you present that in a down to earth, practical approach and answer all their questions, I think you get a lot of folks and that then agree to take this. Not to mention what what I call the penguin effect, which is we all see it in National Geographic, the herd of penguins on the edge of the ice waiting for that first guy to jump in, make sure there's no worker going to eat them. Well, now we've had over 30 million Americans vaccinated, over 2 million in Florida. And I think, you know, that we see that your peers are doing well with this. I think we'll see more and more people accept the vaccine as well. Now, Dr. Vithalani, you did something very unique, actually engaging social media um, with, with our team here. What, you want to explain to the folks what you did to help with some of that? Yeah, so I simply posed the question on a closed internal Facebook group, and I just said, hey, vaccines are coming. Um, what do you want to know? What, what can I do to, to make sure everyone uh, feels comfortable with it? Um, and I also gave everyone the option. I said, hey, if you're embarrassed to ask with your name on it, email me personally, and I'll, and I'll take care of it. Um, and I, uh, I have found myself, um, I was never a big um, sort of article sharer on the internet, but I have found myself with a small following just, just I've, I've got some trusted sources and I just share their information and, and a lot of other people who are struggling to wade through the, the chaff uh, of, uh, of information out there um, have been able to, to sort of latch on and, and just read what, what I would consider, I think, at least trusted sources. And so um, I think on the whole, it makes an impact. I think there's going to be some folks that we're never able to convince. Um, and I think that that's unfortunate, but um, I think the ones that are, that are in that gray zone and just aren't quite sure yet, um, I mean, I think, uh, the, the data is out. If they didn't believe the study data, well, at least we've got some real life data now and it's, it's good to keep updating people on it. So. Yeah, and for those of you that are hanging with us, one of the things that was subliminal there was the use of an internal social media platform like you know an internal closed Facebook group or workplace, workspace, wherever you want to use. Uh, you will find that especially with most of the EMS workers today, they are much more communicative on that platform than they are ever going to be in town hall meetings, conference calls, email, uh, and, and the information that is exchanged, and certainly with Dr. Vithalani's 
uh, offer to answer questions about the vaccine uh, was phenomenal. And, and I think sure had a big impact on our staff uh, going much higher percentage willing to get the vaccine because of uh, the facts that Dr. Bethelani was putting out in a, in a platform that most of our millennial workforce uh, believed in. <laughs> Helps when you're a millennial medical director and you can answer <laughs> questions and memes. O open that door. All right, Amanda, is there one more question we can take before we close out? Perhaps this is related to the resilience and wellness question, um, but Chris was curious, have you, um, have you had any effective strategies for mitigating employee turnover or maintaining staffing levels in your state or in your agency uh, during the pandemic? Ken, you want to take a stab at that? Because we've had one of our biggest yeah, gaps. Just, yeah, sure. Just, just a couple of things. Early on, if you remember, when this was brand new, I think all of us are a little more comfortable with the pandemic than we were in the beginning, way back in February, March. Um, it kind of harkened back to what it was like when HIV first came around. Healthcare workers were terrified of this thing and terrified of just going to work and bringing this home to their family. And are they going to be covered? So one of the things we did was we encouraged folks to... Um, anyone who gets COVID on the job to be considered that to be a work-related injury. So that, that was one thing I think that, that helped ease some of the mindset that if, if they do get something and they got to get, get uh, something bad happens to them, they'll, they'll still be covered. And obviously we covering, uh, ensuring that our healthcare workers got appropriate PPE levels uh, helped. And I already mentioned the, uh, the issue about the pipeline of allowing our students to be able to graduate without having to do in-person clinical stuff and be able to transform that over to high fidelity uh, training. So I think all of those things helped. And I think we, we've already heard some of the, the um, mental support programs that some of my other colleagues have already mentioned. I think that was critical. Uh, things like that are at the local level is really quite critical as well, because there's a lot of stress on folks this, in this last year. All right. Very good. Well, thank you everybody for hanging in with us. Uh, at one point we had over 150 people logged in. Some of them um, obviously could only do it for an hour and that was terrific. I just wanna take a quick moment as we close to really thank these folks, um, obviously outstanding leaders, innovators in their systems and in the nation. The fact that they were willing during these times to take time away from, from their schedule to develop these talking points and to share this information with you. Um, huge kudos to them. So a nice virtual round of applause for those people. As Amanda mentioned, uh, there will be a recording available for people. So we will send out that link through the various hosting organizations, AIM High, NAEMSP, and the SEMSO. Um, and if there isn't any other pressing issue, Amanda, that you seen come have seen come across, I think we'll be okay to close out the webinar. Is that fine with you? That well, sounds wonderful. Thank you everyone for joining us and we will send out that recording um, via email tomorrow. But in the meantime, if you can't wait, please check the AIM High website and Facebook in about two hours. Thanks again. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Be safe.